All right, we are continuing in the 18th book of Israel. We're on chapter 34, chapter 34 this uh, evening. Break that spine there. And it is on page 366. Page 366. There we go. And it is uh, entitled, Daniel 8 Shows the Quartet that is active in the seven-year peace plan shown in chapter 9 for this generation. And this was from Sermon Date Moshe 25 from 11.3.18. And let's look at, um, uh, let's look at uh, verse 2. Pastor opens up and he says, Remember Yahshua's words and the petrol dollar because they just came off of uh, you know, of course, the news and showing the, the wars and the petrol dollar and how, uh, as we're seeing now, even more so in this time period or in the last you know, few weeks, how uh, China, countries like China and Russia are working to distance themselves from the petrol dollar um, so that they can not be underneath these sanctions that the United States puts on these countries when they don't fall in line with them, right? And so they say, well, if we distance ourselves from this and use different currency, then we can go ahead and do whatever we need and not have to ever worry about sanctions coming forth from the United States. Well, the United States doesn't like that, right? Because uh, as the prophecy says, don't hurt the oil and the wine, right? And then, of course, the, the voluptuous living comes forth from this oil that... that um, is uh, continuously pushed, continuously pumped out of the ground and continuously sold to make those who are rich in these, these industries even richer. And so the only option that the United States sees for that, if that source of income or that source of revenue is threatened, is to go to war to eliminate the threat. And of course, that's going to uh, ripple outward and lead to even greater responses from these different countries because as we, we've seen in the news before many, many times, the United States is the one country in the world that has spread out its military forces throughout different nations, okay? It's kind of the, quote-unquote, the big brother of the world, and so it feels that it has to, to be here to exercise its, its influence here, to exercise its influence here, and so we have, you know, troops spread out through many, many countries at this time. Well, places like, countries like Russia and China and, you know, Iraq, Iran... You know, they only have a little focus with their military and might possibly just one area, okay, uh, unless they're in part of some type of a coalition. But typically it's just one area. So as we've seen in times past, while the United States is so spread out, these other countries are able to focus and build their military uh, personnel and their weaponry to a degree that now the United States has have already acknowledged they can't even do anything with the uh, I think it's uh, Russia's newest uh, um, ballistic missile. It's hypersonic missile. You know the one that can travel several thousand miles per hour, and it only gives uh, you know about a uh, 20 minutes before the U.S. could do anything. Uh, that's if it's not uh, uh, fired uh, to a, uh, towards a ship which they only have about 20 seconds to respond if that's the case. So, you know, we're seeing all this buildup right now from the nations uh, towards war because they, don't, they feel they don't need a big brother. Uh, if, if, if a big brother was, was encouraging and, and strengthening and, and helping countries to better themselves, to better the, the, the welfare of their people and their economy, then I'm sure the United States would be a lot more welcome. But of course, that's not the mindset of the beast. Remember, this, this country is, is patterned after the first beast. That, was, that is what was said in Revelations chapter 13. You know, let us be like the first beast. And of course, all the moves, uh, and, and, and we have to keep in mind that, that yes, there, there are men in power. There always have been men in power. Uh, and in and, and the governments and so forth and in these, these regimes. But being not guided by the laws of Yahweh, understanding that there are only two trees, a tree of righteousness and a tree of mixture of righteousness and evil, we have to understand that they too are also being influenced by the serpent, Satan the devil, because her influence spreads throughout the entire world. So what she is doing in this uh, with her hopes, of course, is to get mankind to destroy everybody and hopefully uh, consume the house of Yahweh with it. Um, she's working 
to kind of pick fights, you know, agitate. Did you hear what this person said? Did you hear what that person said? In, in hopes that the countries will go to war with one another. And of course, that that is, uh, you know, she's growing closer to that goal every day. But this is that nuclear baby that that we know is being uh, getting ready to be born at the same time that the Yahweh baby, uh, this house of Yahweh baby is getting ready to be born. But but we know that that this love of money here, of course, as pastor says, is a root of all evil. And of course, many pursuing it have fallen to, to many tr- temptations and traps and so forth. And it's that that love and that pursuit for money, for wealth, for being greater than your fellow man, looking out for only yourself and no one else. Like I remember, uh, <laughs> I remember a movie a long time ago. Um, it was uh, it was a, uh, about politics and it was kind of a comedy. But the guy was uh, who was running against the, the other person who was running for the office of president. His slogan was God bless America and no one else. You know, <laughs> so, now, how do you think nations would 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 feel knowing that this person is getting ready to become the leader or has the opportunity to become the leader of the the free world uh, and, and have a, a great influence over what takes place internationally? How do you think that would make them feel? How do you think their trust level would be regarding that imper- that person? You know, just bless our country and nobody else. Well, it would be a selfish motivation. And of course, he probably, you know, wouldn't uh, make it very long in the office of president. But it says here, that's what we're seeing. And they're bringing that out on the news, this this uh, love of money, this petrodollar. Well, verse three here, pastor says, also remember what I told you years ago, that the United States is going to be strong right up to the very end. And of course, uh, he's mentioned many times that militarily we will be very strong and and to an extent, our, our finances and resources will uh, will be in order to keep infrastructure moving forward. Now, you know, countries don't have a problem shutting down things in order to divert energy to the military. It was done during the time period of, of the First World War. Uh, and and um, uh, many countries, many companies were kind of, uh, maybe I don't know if it's the word commandeered, you know, in order to develop things to give the United States an advantage militarily. Many people were put to work uh, building things like um, uh, bullets and um, cartridges and things like that, uh, weaponry. Uh, Ford got a a big boost in that with the United States military as well uh, and many other uh, companies. And so they don't have a problem shutting off your internet (laughs) in order to divert all their resources to seeing to it that they have strength on the military front. Um, but we know, according to prophecy, that the United States is going to be very strong until the very end. And, and, and part of that is because Yahweh's work is here and, and it needs to continue to do its job until the very end. Okay, and the United States, you know, they might think that that strength comes from them, <laughs> but it doesn't. We know it doesn't. It comes from Yahweh. And of course, Yahweh's going to allow still the United States, still allow the United States to suffer at what they're actually bringing upon other people. And, and, and every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth has to see and understand that, that the things that we're bringing upon ourselves through this love of money, this uh, war, vengeance, and retaliation, that we can actually bring ourselves to a point where we can't return from it. And once these nuclear wars start taking place and, and these scrimmages start building to Russia actually using their hypersonic missile, China actually using their, their nuclear weapons, uh, the United States using their nuclear weapons, Iran and, and, and India and Pakistan and Israel and so forth, uh, you know, it might seem like a great idea at that time, but once the dust settles, now we got to live with the mutually assured destruction that we have given ourselves. And um, I don't know if you've seen some of the um, images of the, the wildfires that are taking place in Australia right now, um, where the um, even the wildlife, and I guess it's anywhere they'll have a wildfire, just like they do in California. The wildlife, of course, are running for safety and protection. But um, some of the images was pretty interesting because some of the, the, the cloud and the smoke, clouds and smoke were so heavy, it was literally almost blocking out the sun. Not completely, but it was just this... You know how when we get the, the, the heavy winds in this area and we get the, the dust storms that, that pick up all that red dust and then the sky is like this this hazy red color? 
because all that dust is in the air. Well, it was like 10 times that, you know, over there because the, the clouds and the smoke was so thick from this fire and the brush burning that it almost completely blocked out the sun. Not, not completely, but, but got it pretty close where people had to drive with their lights on and so forth. Well, you know, when, the, when these wars start and the, the dust is, is pushed up into the atmosphere, sucked up into the atmosphere from these bombs, it's going to do that very thing, except it's going to be a lot greater. It's going to be completely blocked out. The clouds are going to be so thick that it won't allow any, nucle- uh, any sunlight to actually penetrate through the clouds to the earth. And we are completely dependent <laughs> on that sun. Uh, life cannot survive on the earth without the sun. It just can't. Even the things that are in the deepest parts of the ocean, where you might think there is no light, benefit from that which trickles down from the surface of the ocean... Uh, to give them life and food and health and nourishment and so forth. So it's the same thing that that you can comparatively or metaphorically look at the laws of Yahweh in being the same way. You know, life cannot survive without the laws of Yahweh. Mankind cannot survive without the laws of Yahweh. Eventually, he will die off because the things that govern life are found in those laws. Well, in verse, um, uh, the strength that's shown here, Pastor continues in verse 3, Uh, That strength is shown in Revelations chapter 13 uh, to be, let me read that again. That strength is shown in Revelations 13 to be used to make all nations like the first beast. All nations. They want all nations to be like the first beast. Remember, uh, you know, it's it's Satan's desire. And of course, her tool um, that she's using, her organization she's using is, of course, primarily the Catholic Church. And, and her desire is to bring everyone under the subjection of the Vatican, of the Catholic Church, in order to make sure that her will is carried out without resistance. He says, I want to bring you out, I want to bring you remembers what I brought out last week. There are several subjects that lead up to the nuclear war, as you saw one uh, saw on the last part of the news there. Uh, the man said, these things are coming up to start nuclear war. That's what the scriptures show too. The final one is resting on Damascus. Of course, these prophecies and so forth that's been mentioned before resting on Damascus. All these prophecies rest on Damascus. Remember that. The number in scripture is giving us a lot of information on our past work. If you notice, there's a lot of information showing that Yahweh inspired these books and the magazines and everything to be printed and put out to the public. It started with the Mark of the Beast and that's what the hidden codes show too and of course uh the one of the very first things that was done with the um i don't know if it was a prophetic watchman before a prophetic word um you know newsletters that that were going out initially at the very early stages of the house of yahweh and of course to this day uh, we still have the prophetic word and the monthly newsletter going out on a regular basis but but we have so much more information uh, being presented and that's readily available to anybody who is seeking the truth that that there's no doubt in anybody shouldn't be any doubt in anybody's mind uh, in regards to the prophecy in, in uh, Matithia chapter 24 Yeshua spoke about concerning this message going out to the whole world and it wasn't just any time because of course the apostles uh, Yahshua the prophets you know Samuel he had a course that he ran uh, well, he didn't run it, but he, you know, he walked it, uh, or rode a donkey or something. Somehow he got around uh, every year going to different places and meeting with certain people and, you know, listening to the problems and, and giving them solutions. And then he'd end up back at his home in Ramah. OK, but but the message wasn't going out to all the world at that time. Uh, the message wasn't going out to all the world in the time period of the apostles, uh, Yeshua and the apostles. Uh, The message wasn't going out uh, before this last day's work was established, not the message of the kingdom of Yahweh. Okay, Uh, and it wasn't. But just a few hundred years uh, before the house of Yahweh was established that we even got the Holy Scriptures printed and available for everyone to read. Think about that. Just think about that. You know, every for 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 thousands of years, people had access to to the to the books the 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 that which was written before their time period okay because they didn't have the whole book of Yahweh <laughs> they didn't have revelations back then all right but but they had the laws and they had the prophets and what the prophets wrote about and they had access to these things uh and then 
after the apostles, the last apostle got his work finished up, Yachanan, and then, uh, you know, that was taken, of course, by the Catholic Church. And they tucked these writings and they, they hid them for thousands of years until a stink <laughs> got, got risen high enough to the nose of these men. And then Yahweh, of course, forced their hand to make it available. And, you know, and certain people started getting these things printed and, and the time period of the printing press and so forth came about. And then the Catholic Church tried to fight against it. But, of course, it was much too fastly uh, growing at that time to stop it. And, and, and it brought us to the point where, you know, 1934, the witness was born. But, of course, before that, his parents had this information and they were constantly teaching uh, you know, his siblings and, and reading these to him when he was in the womb. So when he grew, he, he had a love for the laws of Yahweh, for the scriptures, the Holy Scriptures, and then started bringing it out uh, as he grew and got older and him and his brother worked together. And then later on, we got the book of Yahweh. Okay. And I don't know how many of you were here early, 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 <laughs> you know, I mean, like early, early, uh, you know, in the, in the late eighties, early nineties, uh, when we had the, the book of Yahweh, it was really kind of um, it was it was it was a lot different. The I guess it was the first or second edition. Um, I don't know. This is what the the seventh edition. What is this? The tenth edition. Um, uh, and and the names were changed. You know, we've got so much more information in this now than we had at the very beginning, right? And and Yahweh's constantly allowed His house to grow in, in knowledge and understanding um, to bring us closer to Him. Um, so, so we have to we have to trust. We have to be patient and wait on Yahweh, and that's what the scripture says. Wait on Yahweh. Uh, the pastor says, if it was up to me, I would have had the kingdom here twenty years ago, <laughs> but I or you wouldn't have been ready for it. And so we have to let Yahweh do His thing with us and, and submit to Him, so that He can bring us to perfection, so we can be ready to enter into that great that great rest. Well, in verse five here it says, and uh, let's see. Um, Let's look down here. I just read that. Let's look down to verse 7. He says, uh, he's talking about the number in scriptures and the hidden code. He says, that's a book I said we went to San Angelo to learn about. Shaul said it was actually California where we went um, to that meeting with the group of Hebrew men who had this book. These are hidden codes. The number in scripture by Bullinger is is totally different book. Uh, it came out here in the United States in 1967, the same year that I was brought to Abilene. 1967. He says, you need to remember these scriptures. Uh, the scriptures are more important than anything. Revelation 17 says they're going to come against the lamb. Uh, Daniel 9 says we got to get, we got into that last week, but we'll get into, um, into it 40 more times in uh, this sermon over. Uh, Daniel gives us what rose up. It was the quartet. He said four rose up. And then referring to that, those, those, uh, those four powers, those peace, those horns, you know, the quartet that wasn't even formed until this time period in these last days. And Daniel wrote about this, you know, thousands of years ago. In verse 10, he says, the book of Revelation is the same way. It was written for us, not for anyone else. History shows it was pinned up. It was put in prison. It wasn't even taken out of prison. Yachanan was in prison when he wrote it. It was collected and put with the rest of the disciples' work in prison and Yahweh's prophets work. Yeah, they had all of this information. I mean, we look at the, the Romans and the Catholics and the Roman Catholics and so forth and think that there's some strange, uh, well, they are a little strange, but I mean, uh, you know, some separate group of people, they separated themselves, but that doesn't take away the fact that they're still uh, yada. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. And they're the ones right now that still hold this scepter uh, given these laws, and, and one of the things Daniel saw, he was amazed by the amount, the, the tremendous amount of laws, you know, this serpent passed, this dragon, this spoke, this spokesman made, the many laws. And the nations today follow in the same footsteps. The United States has thousands of laws on the books, so many laws on the books that, you know, they, they're kind of shocked themselves that somebody actually does a little studying and they find a law that gets them around another law. And, you know, and then they try to sue them and then they find another law that says you can't sue me for this. You know, so they, their hands are tied with their own confusion. Well, um, he says, uh, 
that's what he tells you in Isaiah 34, 16. He was gathering them and putting them together for us. The, that is, these books. Uh, they stayed in prison 1,500 years. No one had a book of Yahweh. No one had a Bible. It came out just before I was born. That is, uh, that work started years before I was born, a few years before I was born. Uh, not many. Uh, I, I, when you look at the, the time period of mankind, you know, a few hundred years or so is not very long. Uh, before Pastor was born, he says, I, I, I had to have a Bible in order to learn it, to be teaching this last day's message to the world. And that he, he is, and he does very well according to prophecy. Let me see here. Let's look over to, um, let's look down to verse 13 there, page 367. He says, well, well, we'll back up here. We got to get this. Uh, in verse 22, now it broke off, speaking of these horns, uh, and whereas four, they are shown in, in the verses before that, uh, before this broke off and stopped, or it came out four. Well, in verse 13, well, when was it? 23, uh, verse 23, and in the last days, the last days of their kingdom, when the transgressors, transgressors have reached their peak, then you start seeing the destruction. Okay, and talking about the destruction that that these four horns, these powers, these, these nations have the power to actually bring upon the earth. They have the ability, the power to take peace from the earth. And they do this with wars. Well, that's our time. This thing, uh, this, that's this generation as Yeshua, Yeshua spoke of in Matthew 24. We covered that last week. Remember it because I'm going to cover it again in the next sermon uh, if you forget it, you won't understand what I'm going to bring next. And that's the problem. People forget. So it would help if you could rehearse these during the week and get it to where they're a part of your life, a part of your brain. Well, he says here, somebody mentioned um, uh, something about uh, tefillins. Uh, they call them phylacteries. If you remember, Yeshua said they make them bigger to be seen by men. Um, stripes, uh, their, their zit seats long and things like this to be recognized of men. The actual fact was uh, they take this little box and put it on the forehead. And of course, that's what the Talmud tells you to do, but the scriptures don't. Uh, it's not in the scriptures, so we don't use it. And of course, uh, you know, these are things that, that they got from Babylon in the time period uh, of... Um, well, Daniel was there and, and many others, but uh, remember, they stayed there 70 years and they were there so long uh, that it was almost like their their whole way of life, the, 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 the way of Yahweh, even their, their language was completely wiped out. They didn't even understand the Hebrew language. They couldn't even read the Hebrew language when they came out after so many generations because they were there learning in the schools of Babylon or the schools of Nimrod. Well, he says in 15 here, I was going to show you a picture of the, 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 tef, the, the tefillin, <laughs> um, but it's, it's, if you've if you ever seen some of the Orthodox, uh, they call themselves Orthodox uh, Hebrews, you know, they have these leather straps and they teach the young men to wrap them around their hands and then they've got the, uh, the same thing. It's also a tefillin that they wrap on their head and it's got a little box in it, you know, and the little box has some scrolls from uh, the Torah. And these, of course, are reminders, and they put these things on when they do their, their morning prayers and so forth. And, and, of course, that's an outward show of it. It doesn't do them any great if they're not actually upholding the law of Yahweh. But pastor's just making mention of the fact that these reminders are beneficial. Now, don't go wrapping belts along your arms and putting belts on your head or anything like that, because, again, he says it's not in the Scriptures, so we don't do it. He says, you don't really have to, in verse 16, spend 100 years on a black box. We got it right here in front of us. It's called the tree of life. It was taken away from the people and never given to them again until Revelations 10 was fulfilled. Uh, Yahweh gave it to them to eat. Remember in Genesis 2, uh, Revelations 10 says, take this tree and eat it. And of course, that is telling about the, the seventh Malak in this time period. And, and of course, he ate the tree. He ate the, the message of the fruit that was coming forth from this tree, and it became a part of him. And many prophets did as well. And, uh, you know, a lot of them said it was uh, bitter, you know, sweet to the taste, but bitter to the stomach and so forth. And, and that's how overcoming is. It, it takes a lot of effort. Well, anybody who doesn't, 
take this tree and eat it. Well, uh, I'll get to it, get into it later and explain it more, whether you understand it or not. I'll get to it a little bit more. But he says, anyway, we come up to the quartet. Now, that quartet that Daniel mentioned there for these last days, we see it wasn't even called the quartet until 2002. Okay, that's right here in the book here. Uh, until 2002. Um, it was prophesied of back here in Daniel in the year 538 B.Y., uh, here in this generation that started in 1934. Okay, and of course, uh, you know, they were formed in, in uh, April of 2002. And, and of course, it includes the United States, the European Union, uh, Russia, and the UN. And of course, their job is to try to uh, monitor and come up with solutions for the Middle East uh, peace progress. Well, he says here, um, uh, so. So you didn't hear of a quartet back then, uh, but he tells you what they're going to do. The scripture says these four are going to rise and this is what's going to take place with them in the last days when sin has reached its peak. And then he talks a little bit about the clouds and the, and the STDs in the clouds that we see taking place right now. And, and of course, you know, the house of Yahweh foretold about these things uh, years even before 2007 when that great prophetic word came out in the in the. Um, uh, and then we had the global warming, the real cause of global warming that came out after that. But uh, but we see that these things are coming about because of sin. And he's showing that these curses that we see in the clouds are the result of mankind's sins. But these same men are the ones who are in charge of pressing the button to release the nuclear weapons. OK, and so we're seeing a, a mi minds of confusion that actually have control over this. We'll look over to verse 22. He says, um, anyway, each one of these little things, these sins that our parents produced back then, starting with Adam and Eve, they went into the genes of the people. So we saw a buildup here uh, of these sins taking place. Why? Because mankind got away from the laws of Yahweh, right? Uh, the abundance of iniquity, because iniquity will abound, the love of many will grow cold. And many grow cold in their graves right now because of sin, uh, either of themselves or from others. Well, it was com coming forth from our parents, starting with Adam and Eve. They went into the genes of the people. Uh, each family from that point to the next generation inherited it and to it, and I'm sorry, and added to it, and the next generation uh, followed the same way. And so we see a ripple effect here of uh, these sins uh, spreading down to the, um, uh, the children and the children's children, exactly as Yahweh told them it was going to be. If you break these laws then these, sin, <clears throat> these sins, these curses, will stay with you to the fourth generation. Uh, and in Exodus, there's even one account where it says to the tenth generation, okay? And so we know that these things can be passed down to our children. Well, you know, Pastor goes on a little bit here talking about, uh, you know, how the priest had to kind of shift their role a little bit from priest to doctor because uh, you think about what Yahweh originally made mankind to do. Right. To 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 form this family and to bring peace to the universe. Well, mankind, starting all the way back with Adam and Eve, got away from that and they started bringing sin into their lives. Well, you know, that resulted with curses and sicknesses in the body. So now we've got to do something to try to counteract that. And that's where these other laws came into uh, came into action uh, to try to prevent this from spreading. And of course, entering into the bloodline of Yahshua Messiah who hadn't been born at this time back in, in Leviticus and Genesis and the time period of the Torah, but was going to be several thousand years later. Well, anyway, we see that this power here and this influence from these four horns, they're all contaminated with the same thing that we see in the world right now with the confusion of the mind and the diseases and the STDs, and they're the ones that are bringing about, going to bring about this one hour burning that's eventually going to kill uh, four-fifths of mankind on the face of the earth. But of course, Yahweh is going to show his power over the gods once again, just like he did in the days of Egypt. So uh, if you'll all please stand, I'll turn it over to the next priest, the great Quran, David Hammerman Hawkins. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. <clears throat> please, please be seated going to continue on chapter 34 of the 18th book of Yeshua. Daniel chapter 8 shows the quartet that is active in the seven-year peace plan shown 
in chapter 9 of Daniel for this generation. And of course, uh, the peace plan spoken of is the one that uh, Daniel 9 speaks about in Daniel 9.27. And he, now he is the prince, the prince of demons, actually. We'll cover that a little bit. And he, the prince, will confirm a covenant with many. And of course, the word many is given, means the name of one of the men who signed the peace treaty, Yitzhak Rabin of the state of Israel. And he will confirm a covenant with many for one week, and in the middle of the week, or the midst of it, so after three and a half years, he will cause the sacrifice of oblation to cease, which it ceased in, 19, in uh, 1997 under Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel. He will cause, the, the instead, notice, instead of peace, instead of bringing peace to the earth, what it's going to bring is the prevalence of the Lord of Heaven, which means the, the full power of Satan, even until the destruction that is determined will be poured out upon the desolator. So uh, there you see the three men who were active in, in uh, coming, coming to and signing the agreement. On the, on the left, as I'm looking at the picture, Yitzhak Rabin, the Prime Minister of Israel, uh, President Bill Clinton of the United States in the center there, and uh, PLO Chairman Yasser Arafat on the right. So that's the peace treaty that Pastor's talking about here in in this, uh, and then he he says Daniel chapter eight. So let's uh, let's go over to. Uh, I'm going to be starting on page three seven zero three seventy, but I'd like to read <clears throat> as Pastor starts out here in this section, uh, Daniel chapter eight verse twenty three, and in the last days of their kingdom. This is the last days of of this this age. This, we're living in the last days. When the transgressors have reached their fullness, just like the prophet uh, Daniel just said in 927, when, when the, talking about the prevalence, we're going to cover that definition a little bit, the prevalence of the Lord of heaven, which means that her full power, authority, and force in the earth. Uh, so in, in, the, in the last days of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, the king of fierce expression, I believe this is talking about the present pope of the Roman Catholic Church, Francis. He's talking about Francis. It, it, it can apply to previous popes too, but there's specific things here where he, he totally fits this uh, description here. The king of fierce expression and understanding dark sentences, in other words, he's skilled in trickery and deception, will stand up. And verse, let's go to verse 25 here of Daniel chapter 8. And through his policy, he will also cause craft, deceit, and fraud to succeed in his hand, and he will magnify himself in his heart. And by peace, and Pastor talks about the, uh, about the Vatican being behind the peace process and being very active uh, in its inception and, and in supporting its uh, implementation. And by peace will destroy many. So not only is he, are many people going to eventually be destroyed by this, this peace process, which will lead in the destruction, as Daniel 9.27 says, but notice who also is going to be destroyed by it. Many, many, Yitzhak Rabin. So two years after the peace treaty was signed, many was destroyed. He was assassinated in Tel Aviv, Israel, by uh, by a right-wing uh, Jewish extremist, if I can use that, that terminology. And by peace will destroy many. He will also stand up against the prince of princes. And this, why, this is why I believe this is talking about Pope Francis, because he's going to be there at the end to oppose the coming of Yahshua. He will also stand against the prince of princes, but he will be broken without hands. <clears throat> So in, uh, on page 370, so we covered the uh, Daniel 8, 23, uh, 23 and 25, and the uh, pastor says, the prince of princes, <clears throat> um, that, that's speaking of Yahshua. The prince of princes is Yahshua. This gives, this gives him away right here. The he that he's speaking of here, this gives him away. He will stand up against the prince of princes. So the he is the uh, <clears throat> is is the is the prince, the prince of demons will stand up against the uh, prince of princes, 
but he will be broken without hands. And uh, in Revelation 7, 17, 14, uh, Revelation 17, 14, if you have your books of Yahweh, you can, you can go there. I have it uh, printed out here. In Revelation 17, 14, it says, these, and the, the word these here is referring to the, the beast. It's referring to the ten kings joined with the woman sitting on the seven hills. These will make war with the lamb, speaking of Yahshua, the lamb, but the lamb will overcome them, for he is ruler of rulers and king <clears throat> of kings. And those who are with him are called, we're all called, and chosen, chosen by Yahweh, and faithful, <clears throat> you know, faithful to Yahweh and his ways. <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> just uh, that word many, the, the word many that's spoken of in uh, Daniel 9.27 <clears throat> and in 8.25, the word many, it's, uh, it's Hebrew word 7, 72.27, and in, it, uh, it's the word, Hebrew word rab, R-A-B. <clears throat> it means abundant in size, in quantity, age, number, rank, quality, uh, <clears throat> captain, elder, uh, some of the words that it's been, been translated. <clears throat> So on getting back to page 370 of, uh, of the book here, in Acts 3.15, Pastor says, let's read that one. <clears throat> I know you're familiar with Revelation 17. So here comes, he comes against the Lamb, makes war against the Lamb, makes war against Yeshua, in other words. Uh, then he says, there are two princes, <clears throat> by the way. One of them is the prince of demons, the one who made the covenant with many, <clears throat> One of them is the prince of demons, and the other one you see right here in Acts. In Acts. So Acts, Acts 3.15 reads, And killed the prince of life, who is Yeshua Messiah, whom Yahweh raised from the dead. <clears throat> of this we are, we are witnesses. Look at verse 14. However, you denied the Holy One and the just, and demanded that a murderer, and speaking of a man named Barabbas, who, who the, <clears throat> the, scri the scribes, Pharisees, uh, demanded be released instead of Yeshua. <clears throat> when uh, Pilate asked him the question, who, who do you want, Yeshua or, or Barabbas? He, they wanted the one who was, uh, they wanted the murderer, should be released to you. So it's speaking of Yeshua Messiah. That's his history. And look at Acts 5 verse 30. The father of our fathers raised up Yahshua, whom you sacrificed by hanging on the tree. And verse 31. Him has Yahweh exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, to give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel, to, to the called out ones of the house of Yahweh. Yet that was, yes, that was his job, and he brought it forth. <clears throat> you know, Yeshua was faithful, a faithful teacher uh, and in, in, in fulfilling every prophecy that uh, the prophets wrote that he would, would do. <clears throat> and now Pastor goes into an article here. <clears throat> um, just, just one thing, uh, since, since Pastor did talk about the uh, prince, he said there's two princes here. We, we, the, the Prince of Princes is our great high priest, Yeshua. <clears throat> the other one, Pastor says, the Prince of Demons. <clears throat> In Matthew chapter 9, verse 34, <clears throat> um, it reads, But the Pharisees said, He, speaking of Yeshua, He casts out demons through the, the Prince of Demons. And the footnote from the book of Yahweh, or the note from the book of Yahweh, says, The prophet Isaiah in 14 verse 5, 15, testifies that Satan, whose name, who also went by the names Hillel, Lucifer, Yahweh's estranged wife, lusted <clears throat> after an office and authority. Yahweh intended to be possessed only by a male being, such as himself or Yeshua Messiah. Now this is a, note for, a footnote from the book of Yahweh, speaking of uh, Prince of Demons. In this unlawful quest to seize this office and authority, Satan, by way of her many deceptions, 
actually passes herself off as a male being in order to make herself appear to be a legitimate possessor of this office and its authority. This is why she is referred to as a prince, a prince of demons. And uh, in, in Romans chapter, uh, not Romans, in Daniel chapter 9, uh, 24 through 27 speaks of the prince. The prince will confirm a covenant with many. <clears throat> this, but it's, uh, it's the adversary who's behind this all. This is why she is referred to as a prince. See Isaiah 14, 12 through 17, and Yekeskia 28, 13 through 19. For full de details, see the book Unveiling Satan, Her True Identity Revealed. We carried that book through a, a airline check, a baggage check point once, and the the uh, the bag the, the guy was watching the the monitor of the um, metal detector. He saw me the book come down the conveyor. He said, "Wow!" The, he was he, he was amazed at the title of that book. Her Satan, her tr her true uh, identity revealed. He was he was totally amazed by that. Pastor gets into an article here now in verse 37 of this chapter where he's talking about, he says, uh, the quartet and roadmap history and structure. That's the title of the article. The Middle East Quartet emerged from a desire among the four principal international players engaged in the peace process. The peace process was, uh, was what Daniel spoke of in chapter 9, which we just read, 27, verse 27. This They will confirm a peace process with Rabin, Daniel 9. And the article continues, engaged in the peace process, and now it's giving the names of the quartet, and many of, the, many of us are familiar with these names. You have the United Nations, you have, uh, that's one, the United Nations is heavily involved. You see it active throughout the whole world, and you see it, it's guided by the Vatican. The Vatican actually means the divining serpent. The real serpent is Satan, who in Revelation 17 is spoken of as the dragon, you know, the spiritual force behind the Vatican, the, the spiritual, negative spiritual influence, I would say. The real, the real serpent is Satan, the devil. This is her divining serpent that is being led by her and they're, they're doing exactly what she tells them to do. The United Nations is another uh, member. So the United Nations is one of the quartet. The United States, the second member of the quartet. The European Union, third member. And the fourth member, the Russian Federation. To consult more closely over Middle East conflict and resolution. So uh, historically, I mean, the quartet got started in the early 2000s. Here, uh, verse 40, on 10 April of 2002, now this was right after 9-11 uh, in this time period, the government of Spain representing the rotating presidency of the European Union and the high representative of the, of the common security and foreign policy, Javier Solano, hosted the Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, UN Secretary of State Colin Powell, and Russian Foreign Minister Igor Ivanov. These representatives, who had already met at the margins of the, of, of the 56th General Assembly session in 2001, so really, the first time they met officially as an organization was 2001, although I think uh, historians give them uh, 2002 uh, as, as the the beginning of it, credit, came to be known as the Quartet, or, or four, Quartet. And the article continues here, intermittently, close, uh, close, close coordination and collaboration between the Quartet and members has proceeded on the ground on the envoy level through the United Nations Special Coordinator and Special Representative to the European Union for the Middle East Peace Process. The Special Envoy of the, of the United States and later the Assistant Secretary of Near East Affairs. All of these four are, are, follow the Vatican. <clears throat> in the, in a, the article continues here. In, now notice, Pastor said, all of these four members of the quartet follow the advice 
and uh, guidance of the Vatican. In its meeting on April 10, 10 uh, April 2002, the Quartet laid the foundation of what later became a performance-based roadmap to a permanent two-state solution. They laid the foundation for this two-state solution, Pastor says, that is shown in Daniel, by the way, dividing the land for gain. And what they were trying to do was work out uh, the problems that had been caused, I should say, the situation that had come up as a result of the, uh, of the 67 war. I'd like to read you just a little bit here. This is, uh, I mean, it goes back, this, this whole peace process, the need for the whole peace process goes back to the, the formation of the State of Israel in 48, the subsequent war with the Arabs in 67. And that, that really was the start of the, what, uh, what they're trying to solve today. Uh, this, is, uh, this is from Haratz, Israeli News. It says, uh, it's talking about the Green Line, which is the, which is the border uh, around the, the land of Israel, uh, which kind of separates the West Bank Arab territories from the, from the land of Israel, the state of Israel. The Green Line refers to the 1949 armistice line between established between Israel and its Arab neighbors in the aftermath of the 1948 War of Independence, when Israel became a state in 1948, 71 years ago. The war led to the sovereignty of the fledgling Jewish state over 78.5%. When they originally divided the land, when the UN proposed the division of the land of Palestine between the, 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 the uh, Israelis and the, and the Arabs, it was like 50-50. But then, they had, then the Arabs uh, came against Israel when they were trying to get started there. They fought that war in 1948. So a year later, uh, when it all was over with, uh, Israel had 78.5% of historic Palestine, now commonly referred to as, Israeli, as Israel inside the Green Line. Beyond the Green Line lay the Jordanian-controlled West Bank and the Egyptian-controlled Gaza Strip. Continuing here from what Harat says, the Green Line effectively divided the holy city of Jerusalem in half. And this is one of the main contentious points today in this whole process that they're trying to fix. It's the city of Jerusalem. During the 1948 war, Israel made like zero progress in trying to gain part of the city of Jerusalem. They had some some part of the city, and they basically maintained that. I mean, there were times when the people were starving in the city. They had to get supplies to them, but they didn't make any progress. So when this armistice ended, the, the Arabs had most of contr the control of the city of Jerusalem. But anyway, the Green Line effectively divided the holy city of Jerusalem in half with the Israel-Jordan -Jor border running through the middle of the city with the old city and the holy sites on the Jordanian side. Now, here, was, here came along the 67 war. The 1967 Six-Day War changed the geopolitical landscape and resulted in territories beyond the Green Line falling under Israeli control. Internationally, these areas are not recognized as part of Israel, although shortly after the war, Israel annexed East Jerusalem. So right after the war, they annexed East Jerusalem, made it part of the land of Israel. And in 1980, did the same for the Golan Heights, a previously part of Syria. <clears throat> Since the 1967 war, successive Israeli governments have built settlements beyond the Green Line and lands that the Palestinians claim as theirs. So <clears throat> that's, that's part of uh, what's going on there right now. I, the Israelis don't seem to be in any, any major hurry to get this peace process done. Why? Because little by little, they're building up their settlements in the, in the Arab territories. So a little by little, they're, uh, they're, ga they're gaining uh, control of the land. But Israel's control of the Palestine, Palestinian territories is still unrecognized according to international law. And then Haratz continues, in 1993, the Oslo Accords, and that's the covenant that was signed with Rabin and Arafat. In 1993, Oslo Accords stipulated that steps be taken towards attaining Palestinian self-rule in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. As agreed upon in talks, the Israeli Defense Forces evacuated <clears throat> its post in most of the Palestinian cities, and Israel agreed to a negotiated peace deal roughly based on the Green Line, <clears throat> or 
or pre-1967 lines. So this is what the Oslo Accords were all about. But the thing is, they never finished it. <clears throat> they gave them some things. They, the, uh, you know, after the 67 war, the West Bank was occupied, militarily occupied by Israeli troops. Uh, but as part of the Oslo Accord, they pulled back some of that occupation, military occupation. But the thing is, <clears throat> they're trying to finish the process. But uh, <clears throat> the, uh, <clears throat> the, 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 the Palestinians, they want East Jerusalem as, a, as their capital. <clears throat> and uh, I'm not sure, I, I don't think that that's part of what's going to be offered in the, in the final settlement. <clears throat> So, so, the, so along the way here, the quartet has been working to try to find a resolution to this matter. They laid the foundation for the two-state solution that is shown in Daniel, by the way, dividing the land for gain. They're doing it right now. <clears throat> the two-state solution, they're the ones that laid the foundation for the two-state solution on April 2, 2002. It's a two-state solution to the Israeli and Palestinian conflict, or in short, <clears throat> it's called the roadmap. <clears throat> now, the pastor goes into the, uh, the opening of the, the U.S. Embassy here in Jerusalem. He said, that's part of the quartet's management. The quartet is led, believe it or not, by the Vatican Church, by the ones who control America. In Revelation 13 shows you, starting with about verse 15, the two-horned beast, uh, two horns, the, those are the Catholics and the Protestant, the two main uh, religious groups here in the United States. The two-horned beast led by the Vatican, you can see this from the laws they passed. The lawgiver comes from, from Yada, of course, Yada, the, the Vatican, referred to here. So when they put someone in office, you can bet that one in the Supreme Court is going to do the will of the Catholic Church. <clears throat> Call them what you, what you want, Pastor says, Democrats, Republicans, whatever they can <clears throat> create, another, uh, whatever, they can create another party, I guess, if they want to, but it would still be run by the Catholics. They are dominant. <clears throat> they are the dominant religion. Now, Pastor used the word dominant, which here, which, which I think is pretty interesting, <clears throat> because that's what Daniel, that's what Daniel said would be in these last days, because in, a, after they shut down the peace treaty in uh, 97, <clears throat> the, the prophet, the prophecy said that what, what, you, what you're going to get, what you're going to get, it said instead, he will cause the prevalence the prevalence of the Lord of heaven, even until the destruction that is determined will be poured upon the desolator. Prevalence, the word prevalence. So, best to use the word here, dominant religion, they're the dominant religion. Well, the word prevalence means the quality or state of being prevalent. Okay, now let's get a definition of prevalent. Prevalent means powerful. It means dominant, and it means widespread. So that's that's what that's what that's da Daniel saying. That's what we're going to have in, in in the world today. This 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 uh, evil power that's powerful, dominant, and widespread. That's that. Would, instead of peace, that that's what the world is going to get, and that's what they've got. They are they are the dominant religion. Pastor says they are the only ones who ha who have a seat in the UN permanent status. Okay, so why do they have a permanent seat in the UN? The Muslims don't have a permanent seat. They're represented by other countries, I guess, but uh, the, uh, the, the Orthodox don't have a permanent seat. Well, the reason the Catholic Church has a permanent seat is because they're a sovereign country. They're a sovereign country. <clears throat> and this goes back to... Uh, this goes back to the Lateran Treaty of 1929, right when the two witnesses were were in the were being born, uh, Jacob in 26, uh, Pastor in 34, Yisrael in uh, 34. The Lateran Treaty was signed, and this was in response to uh, confiscation of property 
from the Catholic Church by the Italian government in the 1870s. So, so by 1929, they came to a resolution of, the, of that matter, and it was called the Lateran Treaty. And so what did the Catholic Church get as a result of the Lateran Treaty in 1929? One thing they got, a political treaty recognizing the full sovereignty of the Vatican City, calling it the nation, calling it the Holy See. So in the UN today, permanent status, they're called the Holy See. They are recognized as a sovereign nation. They also got a plan for the territory of the Vatican City State, which is hundred, about 111 acres in the, inside the city of Rome. They got a list of plans and buildings with exemptions from expropriation and taxes. No, no taxes on their property. They got a financial settlement. They got money. They got a cash. And it's interesting that, you know, after this agreement was signed, several months later, what did, what did we have here in the United States? We had the crash, the financial crash of 1929. What a coincidence, okay? A finance, but they got a, a cash settlement for the property that the Italian government confiscated from them. And they also got the fifth point here, a concordant, a con concordat reg regulating relations between the Catholic Church and the Italian, the Italian state. In fact, they became the official religion of Italy. And they also were qualified to, to uh, receive a tax that the Italian government uh, collected <clears throat> from, from the Italian people as a state religion. So the opening up in the embassy in Jerusalem, this article says, will close the door on America's key role in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And past, Pastor comments here, he says, that's not, that's not exactly true. Uh, I, think, I think what the article was implying was that uh, since, since the opening of the embassy in Jerusalem, uh, the, the uh, Arabs have not been a part of the negotiating process because they, they don't uh, trust the, the United States being impartial and, and looking out for their, uh, their, uh, the things that they want, which is they, they want East Jerusalem as their, as their capital. So this was uh, the fifth Roman month, 14, 2018, Pastor says, uh, there's a picture, and underneath it, the, United, the U.S. consulate in Jerusalem. Since the signing of the Oslo Accords in 1993, the, the United States has been the primary negotiator. Yes, yes, they were. <clears throat> uh, and uh, between the Israelis and the Palestinians, Bill Clinton came closest to ending the conflict during the failed Camp David summit. Now, this was in 2000. They were, you know, some historians say that the the Camp David Accords, which were a follow-up to the Oslo Accords, the Palestinians would have received like 95% of what they wanted. The only thing they weren't offered or, or agreed to be given was the city of Jerusalem as their capital. And uh, so they rejected it. They could have had 90, 96, 96, 95% of what they wanted in 19 and 2000 but they uh, they said no no we want we want it all and so what they what have they gotten not much <clears throat> so uh, bill clinton came closest to ending the conflict during the failed camp david summit get that the united states has been the primary negotiator this article says and then uh, pastor here goes goes into <clears throat> He goes into uh, he goes into the United a little more about the United States. I'd just like to uh, in the minute or so I've got left here the uh, the likeness it talks about the the, the likeness of the beast uh, the the second beast the, uh, and uh, the descriptions given in Revelation uh, 13 and it talks about uh, I mean the United States fits Revelation 13 perfectly. In uh, any country who doesn't uh, do it, do things exactly the way they want, it's sanctions. You know, you can't buy or sell or, buy, sell or trade unless you do it our way. And they also uh, described in Revelation 13 
as uh, the one that brings fire down from heaven. Well, we saw that in, uh, in uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima after World War II or ending World War II. But we also saw it yesterday when these missiles uh, from the drone came out of the sky and, and, uh, and killed this uh, very famous, uh, prominent uh, uh, Iranian general. I mean, so, uh, you know, the, <clears throat> the, these, these things are, are going to lead to what, uh, what Pastor says, the events in the uh, fourth part of the earth, and one third of the people are going to be destroyed. And so that's, that's really what we're looking at. And uh, the events uh, very, very prophetic. I'm looking forward to looking, watching the news here in the sanctuary tomorrow. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be a lot more information brought about that.